Hey, everybody. Welcome back to amazing another show of Real Estate Uncensored. We're doing mortgages today, guys. We're talking about the incredible timeline, the history through history of mortgages and credit. I cannot wait to learn just kind of what is the history lesson we're going to be able to take away here. Let's look at historically what mortgages have looked like. And we have nobody better in the world to do that with than our dear good friend, our new co-host, Miss Alyssa Glutz. How are you? Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Um, yeah. The, uh, you you said nobody better to go through this with. If you knew how obsessive compulsive I was, then you would know where this came from. <laughs> well, I do know you. That's why I said it. <laughs> 7 a.m. You're like, what the hell? I'm like, it's an interactive color-coded history. You're like, it's awesome. 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 We're trying to be historians now. So anyway, yeah. But um, I think it's really good stuff. Now, see, uh, I'm just talking, telling you right now, I'm I'm being transparent here. I'm just trying to share this live. So if you're watching this right now, please share this live. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. Okay. So let's get into it. Let's get into so, it. Pretty fascinating. So Chad, Chad, my boyfriend and I, we we're talking um, a lot <laughs> over the weekend because I had no dates, no nothing. Anyway, uh, the funny thing is, is... Um, as you kind of prompt chat GBT with different stuff, it starts uh, taking you down a road, which is what I love. So I just wanted to understand when the first auto loan was, when was the first time somebody took out an automobile loan? And then I wanted to know when the first mortgage was taken out. So let's, that's our question. Let's just uh, go ahead and you can comment or Greg, let's start with the auto loan. When do you think what year, was the first auto loan? You can't look at the paper. <laughs> Damn it! It's too late. Um, first auto loan. Uh, no, I, try I, to remember what you thought, like initially, like what was the first thing? Oh, when I got a loan. No, or when was the first thought that came to mind of when you think uh, Americans got their first auto loan? What year? Nineteen hundred. See, it's funny you say 1900 because I, I mean, I don't know why, but I was just thinking like 1940 or something. And I had to go look it up. Like, when was the Model T and all that? Oh, anyway, it was a few years before that. But, you know, so 1919 was the first auto loan. General Motors, you know, uh, came out with General Motors Acceptance Corporation, GMAC, as we know today. And they huh. were the first one to give an auto loan. But in the beginning, auto loans were, they not a lot of people financed cars, but if they did, it was maybe a two or three year loan. That's it. But the funny thing was, is that it wasn't until like the 80s when auto leases started becoming really popular that, um, you know, because of the, comp in order to compete with these cheap payments, people could be like, you could still get a hat car brand new and you just have this much lower monthly payment. So to have to compete with that, auto loans started spreading out that term mm. and we got the four year and we got the five year loan and six. And now today, the most common uh, loan term is about 68 years. I mean, 68 months, 68 oh years, Holy 68 God. months is Crap. like, so that's almost six years. Uh, but they, you know that there's some loans out there that they have for 10 years. So, you know, it's interesting. Just the auto loan in general, just thinking about how uh, that was. Um, it's today, if you think about it, from somebody who goes from 18 all the way up to 68, the price of cars that they'll buy in their lifetime in that time frame, insurance and gas, it's about a half a million. And then if you add a low credit score to that, number that's about double in what you will spend in your life when it comes to cars gas insurance and you know repairs so you really gotta think about that that's gonna be a big I mean, in order for you to function in life that's uh that's you know you were huh. born and you have that debt on you in a way i mean it's weird to think about that so let me ask you a question then that that is fascinating because i mean when you really crunch the numbers i mean half a million dollars you know that shit that's a lot of money oh. um which you don't really get any benefit from but you need to have it um yeah. and so that's on the low why, one too why do know? they call it the american dream to buy a home is it in propaganda because is it no. the american dream to go fully into debt or is yeah. the american dream to be free and follow your passions well, you know, that's what leads us into even the next part. And was, that was part was really interesting. Mortgages, um, you know, mortgages became really a lot more popular after uh, 19, like 20. But uh, mortgages technically went back to like all the way into the 1700s. 
you know? And so that's, I thought that part was kind of interesting, but it wasn't, here's the thing though, the mortgages in the beginning, you, mm -hmm. they were basically about a five year loan in which you had payments and then you had a huge, you know, a half of it was going to be a balloon payment at the end of the five years. Seriously? Yeah. Nobody ever had the money after five years in the early 1900s to, to, you know, to do it. So they refinanced. It's weird to think about people like in the 1920s, you know, refinancing, but yeah. So it's interesting to think, uh, what, what, what the, at the, the beginning, what, the, what did the mortgage was, broker do with like a half a page contract? Do they do literally take a hand? Like, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. On it. <laughs> and think about it. Everything was like, uh, you know, this is before credit scores and everything. Credit scores literally this part that'll blow you away when we get to how long we've actually been using credit scores. Okay. But back then it was like, Hey, you know, you go to the, the County, the general store and, um, Earl wants to get some seeds, you know, for his farming. And, um, you know, he didn't pay back uh, Sally last week and now it's all over town that uh that earl doesn't pay his bills and so now mm -hmm. earl can't get any credit anywhere and it all came back down to you know maybe it was his ex-wife who started the rumor you know what i mean it was lucky so yeah it's kind of a way so when you look at this little timeline so i, I kind of got off base but we were talking oops i took that down uh we got to the auto loan then the mortgage and then what really fascinated me it wasn't until 1936 when fha was originated uh, which was started fha Federal Housing Administration, like they made it uh, suddenly they had FHA was like, we will ensure we will back uh, these loans as long as they meet these guidelines. If they meet that, we will insure it. OK, a bank. So a bank's going to go put their money up and say, you know, we'll, we're going to we're willing to invest this money because now we have the government who's basically backing us. OK, that they're uh -huh. going to insure it. OK, that if something defaults that we're not out of money. So FHA. So in the beginning, FHA only offered like 15 year fixed. OK, and then 1938, Fannie Mae starts uh, saying that they'll buy FHA loans. OK, and then it wasn't until 1948 that a new home could get a 30 year fixed. No, so now we've spread out the loan. Now we spread out this payment. So in the beginning, you know, it was all part of our budget, what our monthly payment was going to be. Well, pretty soon, you know, the, the, the house price goes up. And then when you're borrowing money with that interest, you know, how are you going to pay for it? Well, now we got to start spreading it out to 15 years, 20 years. That's what they do with car loans. You know, you walk in there saying, I want a $400 car payment. They'll give you a $400 car payment over 10 years. And then you look up what the interest you're paying over oh 10 years, you know, you never do that. So it's just interesting. I feel like um, you look at the ability, when did things start really changing, you know, on the mortgage side? Um, so you say, so, so uh, what we were saying is 1948. Okay. New homes get a 30 year fix. So, so then, it was not 1930. It was not 1938, not 1939. Sorry, it was 1948 is what you said. Yes. Okay. So 1948. So then it wasn't until 19, what was it? 54. I think it was, hold on. Yeah. 54 was when a resale home could start getting a 30 year fixed. So the other ones were new homes, you know? So then we start going into private insurance. Okay. Private mortgage insurance comes along in 1957. <laughs> that is what, uh, basically allowed people then to end up putting down less than 20%. They used to have to put 20% down, you know, cause they could get the mortgage, but you know, they couldn't, they didn't have anybody to, um, again, back the investor that this was going to be a good risk. Okay. In order for people to put less than 20% down, they got to have an investor basically coming in saying, uh, we will insure this. And basically if they don't pay it, uh, then we got your back. Okay. So the PMI is when you pay that, when you put less than 20% down on a home and you pay this private mortgage insurance and people go, well, what's that? What do I have to pay that for? This is basically an insurance premium in a way that you're paying not for your benefit, but it pays the investor back, you know, if you default on the loan. So it makes it possible for you to put less than 20% down. So 1957, first M, the first one that came out, the first private mortgage insurance company was one called MGIC. And it's still around today, but that was the first one. Then 1960, 1963, more PMI competition comes along. 
And then um, I want to get into what happened in 1974 because I'm a woman. Before, <laughs> okay, what happened? Before 1974, I could not um, get a credit card in my name. I couldn't um, apply for a mortgage without having a husband co sign. What? Yeah. 1974. What 1970, three years before I was born, a woman. What? wasn't able to get credit and then the equal credit opportunity act came along and it wasn't just women it it made it to where you couldn't discriminate in lending anymore okay and women got the right to apply for credit in their name alone without what? a co-signer husband yep is that crazy that is freaking nuts so that <laughs> opened the door so when you think about that right now women um, single women, you know, were 20% of the first time home buyers last year. Okay. Um, and it's a growing, it's like the fastest moving first time home buyer, you know, population. And, and men were like, it was like eight, you know, four, what was it? Five or 6% or something. But women were a big part of single first time, you know, first time home buyers, single people. So that is, you know, something I've actually joked around about that. I did some study and research on that when I was training, I was the head trainer at my old brokerage. And I found that, what was it? it was, I thought it was 9% of all purchases at that time were single females. Yeah. So, so I made the joke. I'm like, hey, guys, girls are a lot wealthier than you because <laughs> you're like 6%. You might want to start dating up in the world. Yeah. You know, ask if they're looking to buy a house. Well, About 9% of them are. I'm uh, telling you, you know how the whole Roman Empire trend we were talking about, and you're like, Bleh. I'm like, so I know, stupid. but listen, <laughs> there is something to it as far as, you know, men and women. And I, I've thought a lot about it. Like, what is women's, you know, Roman Empire? What do we think about probably more than you would expect us to think about or our brain go to? There's a lot of different things I can think of, but I, I'm going to say that it has to come back to like money in one way or another. If you weren't raised around a lot of males, if you didn't have a daddy, like a lot of us girls, you know, growing up, then a lot of that stuff um, that's been just naturally more of a patriarchal, you know, kind of a, you know, you didn't have somebody to kind of show you those things that I know for a lot of the women I know at my age, we're really interested. Like we're really interested we it, we are naturally intrinsically motivated to um learn and 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 i think you got like in other words we're walking past the tv and there's something on the big short or something like that we're i i think at least the women i know are more natural to like sit down and want to learn where i think you guys walk by rome and go oh what's this i haven't seen this one before julius caesar oh he's so cool no <laughs> that is never something that's ever come out of my mouth ever other than that, I just think like Marilyn Monroe. I, I probably think about Marilyn Monroe once a week, and that's probably weird for people. I don't mm. know. I like her fashion and beauty and all that. I like, I like, I think about gowns a lot. I don't know. Okay. So you, I mean, everyone's going to have that little kink that they're going to think about. And I, I'm not saying kinky. I said kink. <laughs> but, all right. I didn't go there, but I guess that's, that's your thing, right? That's what you think about. A lot. <laughs> I'm <laughs> an adult <laughs> male. I'm, <laughs> I live in the gutter uh, mentally. But yeah. in in all in all jokes aside, of course, all joking aside, um, probably the one thing I think about the most is probably visibility uh, with doing this show. So it's mics and lights and cameras and editing and videoing and content. Uh, how to get my SEO score up? How to get more video views? How to work with more clients? How to systematize things? Uh, what what systems to use? You know, how do I take myself out of the transaction? I work. I think about that stuff a lot yeah um but it's definitely says your girl obviously is your girl jackie but i was gonna is make she like point. are you jackie going to stop loves no. to study about money i mean she says it all the time she's like she did you know and i'm like oh fuck i gotta listen to this again yeah but, but then she's like well if you just do that and you do this and you do that and tweak that there and i'm like you had me at boring start over <laughs> what there's and so, so much creativity in it though you there know it is and there and what it's like it is a tool to know yeah. financing yeah uh, it, and in the debates with uh, uh uh trump and hillary clinton hillary made a very interesting statement and she's like well you know you know avoid paying taxes he's like yeah i'm gonna keep you know keep you know with my tax cuts and the only reason why is because all of your donors and you use them too right so 
with that being said, with no politics being involved, right? it's knowing how to work the system, not be worked by the system. Not be, and yeah. it's all legal. Yeah. You, you are not told how mm-hmm. to do it because no. the dumber you are, the more money the big banks make. The smarter you are, the less they make if they make any from you and they don't want anyone to know about it. So a show like this, under, under uh, kind of un, um, unearthing some history, like the 1974, totally. up until 1974, a woman could not get a loan. Yeah. That is, that is insane. Mind-blowing. Yeah. I mean, well, and, and you know what, there's a lot more too. there's, that's even just the beginning because when, I mean, well, we're, I'm not going to, I don't want to jump too much ahead, but I can remember being at ASU in 19, I graduated in 1999. I feel like such an old person when I start with 19, you know, but anyway, 95 to 99, I was at Arizona state university. I remember my first freshman year walking to the little gym. And, um, by the time I got down this walk, um, I had three t-shirts, uh, a couple water bottles, and they were all free for uh, applying for credit cards. It was my first moment of going, huh? Cause you know, in college, it used to be that they like flat out marketed to you. They were oh, like, yeah. you know, apply for this, apply for that. So we all, you know what we did first kids out of college, you know, mentally, you used it. I'm like, you're giving me $2,000 at Dillard's. I, I'm like, oh, I'm going, you know, <laughs> and then I spent 2000 on my first trip. I was like, woo. And then my mom's like, yeah, now you just make the payments, you know, that they tell you to make every month. That's how I thought. Like I thought I didn't even understand minimum payment, like that, that payment will technically never pay that off. You're just going to rent your debt. If you do it that way, never so knew that. And, and so that's again, just, something else. Okay. Nobody ever tells you. Minimum, right. minimum payments, you're, you're renting your debt. Very well put. You are renting your debt. Rent a center. Remember those? Renting your fridge. That yep. sounds so like, what? You're doing the same thing with credit cards. You're renting debt when you don't Ugh. pay. You know? So the thing is, is that, that really blew me away, though. But uh, during the, uh, right after the housing crash, Obama, the Credit Card Act of 09, he signed. And in the Credit Card Act of 09, he put a stop to marketing under 21 years old. No so when kidding. you think about that, yeah. And when you think about that, they said no more marketing to under 21 years old anymore. Um, uh, if they, if an under 21 year old person, you know, wants to get a credit card, they, they typically have to prove like they have, you know, when you apply for a credit card, you usually don't have to show income, mm-hmm. but you do when you're under 21 or you have to have a cosigner, you have to prove that uh, you have a cosigner. job. You know, and so they give you like some student cards where they give you a little bit of leniency, but it's pretty hard to get credit going under 21. And so what I thought is, okay, that's good, Obama, but you're just, you're going to set back four or five, you know, four or five years back people from really um, getting into the credit game. And so I knew that that would also push probably the starting point of when people buy homes you know, unless they had credit products that came out that helped 18 year olds start building credit, you know, which they do. But And there's some other ways. Yeah. But I mean, here's the thing. I mean, when I was in college, Mm -hmm. I was only a couple of years behind you. And uh, And I I was given a Chevron credit card for gas. Yes. Guess what else is sold at Chevron's? Um, beer. Every kind of food and beer and, and gas they, for your friends. And they call wait, the wait. credit card company called my father one day and goes, uh, Mr. McDaniel, uh, my name is so-and-so where we're Chevron and we're calling about card number three. Okay. Uh, sir, it seems that this card is having an excess purchases of beer. Were you aware of this? <laughs> He's like, I am now. Yeah. And reality I, bites Winona Ryder. That was like, oh. I watched it and went, that's an idea right there. Put gas yeah. in people's car, take their cash. <laughs> exactly. The exactly. And I learned very quickly, credit cards are not free, but a lot of college kids, I mean, like you, it's free. Mm-hmm. It's not free. There's a huge no. debt attached to it. And I actually, I, politics aside, I mean, that that is something I, I got to say is a good move and to keep the 18 year olds out of debt because I mean, they're going to go so far in the hole. My buddy who I lived with, uh, he never this is the weirdest thing. He would never do laundry. He would just go buy more clothes on his dad's credit card. That's hilarious. That's great. <sighs> he smells. Guys could do that, you know, <laughs> girls, we got smart because we used to buy, you know, how we change clothes, you know, like we know how you know how we we can wear an outfit one time, you know, if it's one of those kind of outfits. So we learned 
you know, because of we're one timers that we need to embrace second, secondhand clothing. And now, um, I think I heard something the other day that said like 75 or 65% of everything in people's house is secondhand. My, I, well, uh, the, the desk this is sitting on, this is my, this was my dad's dad's desk when he was a doctor, yeah. uh, a dining room table. Downs. Yeah. Bookshelf, bookshelf. Ah, shit, man. I got a lot of secondhand shit in my house. You should see my closet. And oh, so we got yeah. a lot really smart with that. The women, we, I mean, the secondhand uh, industry has just gone through the roof the last few years. You know, the real, real and the luxury yeah. stuff. A lot of us figured out one time after you buy some, which I didn't even do. Uh, my my ex husband walked me into Prada and picked up a wallet that was this big, and it was about I don't know four thousand or something. Ugh. And he walked in and picked it up, and he goes, "Grab my hand," walked out. He goes, "We'll never go back there." And I was like, oh, "Don't worry, dude. I would never spend my money on this ever, but I would buy a second hand." Um, I've got a nice Chanel purse. I like it. No, who cares? Nobody cares. Well, whatever. Girls, I don't really care. But 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 there's More a the different. But there's a difference here. Like getting yourself a nice bag after you worked really hard, or right. you closed a big deal, or you set goals and you achieved them. Go out and buy yourself something nice that you really want and will really use. Mm -hmm. Just flagrant spending, you know, because mm -hmm. you have the credit. Totally different story. Like my girlfriend, she is a penny pincher, and if it's not on sale or discounts, we're not buying it for the right. house. And I got to tell you, man. The amount of money I've saved, I mean, yeah. it's astonishing how much money I was blowing by just not checking the deals and not kind of following coloring within the lines. Yes, um, very good point. You know, she has, she's a very uh, financially wealthy, uh, smart person who's done very well for herself financially, right? Mm -hmm. I'm very happy for her. She's very, 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 very um, kind of in tune with finances. Yeah. But she drives a 2012 Mustang that makes funny noises. I love it. <laughs> it creaks everywhere. And, and she makes killer money and she's smart. It's not just about making money. It's how do you, do you keep it? Do you save it? Do you invest it? Do you get to do other things? Do you get to grow it? Yep, do you get to exactly. give it? That there's a whole nother level of success when you got to the point where you're just giving it. Okay. But yeah. Like, yeah. It, it's a it, whole, it's a, I like her a lot, you know, you're, but it's girl. important. Like she's, I do too. Trust me. <laughs> Bigger, um, bigger. But I mean, it, it's one of the things when, I, like I said earlier in the show, that she'd be, she'd be, hey, Greg, watch this YouTube video. Hey, Greg, check this out. Hey, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, oh, fuck. We are so meta. We are so meta all the time, you know? Can you imagine? Uh, oh. And she's like, this is really good. This could save us a lot of money. And I'm like, us? <laughs> yeah, I'm paying attention now. What's up? <laughs> but it took a smack in the dome to realize that. And yeah. why, why, why don't they teach easy math? In high school and college, like, I'm not talking like two plus two equals chicken. No. I'm talking like how to bounce a checkbook, how to get your credit ready for, for a mortgage, how to build how to generational wealth, lease. how to yeah. negotiate a re lease. You know, now you can do it because you can go to chat G GPT and ask them the questions yeah. and you can get a great start. But in the beginning, right. you're not taught that. You and I are in our mid to late forties. Well, not late, mid mid forties. Um, I was never mm -hmm. sat down and said, Hey, this is how what you're going to need to do to get your credit right to buy a house. This is the history of this. This is why you should and should not buy. This is how you, you know, look at your, here's your credit card for the first time. Like you've taught many times, look at when the note, when it's due Statement comes yeah, and say, okay, I need to be paid off at two days prior to going uh, fast with my credit card till day after, mm -hmm. and then repeat the cycle, put on your calendar. Right. You will come out with great credit why has no one ever told me this like paying attention to the credit cards and really like knowing oh i if i have a discover card i don't just automatically get five percent cash back i have to literally go over there once a quarter and 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 hit activate a Are category you kidding me every three months you have to go in there and hit activate then you need to read here's the thing you could be going to this gas station down the road thinking well my credit card gives me five percent cash back Mm, okay, look a little closer on your statement because you'll notice that actual gas station that you keep going to, if you would have gone to the one across the street, that one's coded as a gas station. The problem what? is the one you go to, it has a merchant code as a grocery store. So it's not considered what? a gas station. Not kidding. Look up merchant code locations. Yeah, you know. Fuck off. Yeah. 
So it has to be coded. Look, they they pull people in saying use the credit card and get these points. Then you try to go take the points. I mean, that's a whole nother show. But like then you go over to the Amex site and you go to use your points and you're like, these these prices are double what I could find on Kazoo or whatever the heck. I'm like, why would I? Anyway, you're not getting anything. So you really have to be careful with that whole game and realize like they just I'll tell you what the people that are Amex Platinum or um, uh, Delta Delta people are. Are, are mad right now. They are cra- they're going to take it down because Delta basically said, we're not going to give access to our lounges anymore because they're getting too overcrowded. Um, unless you're flying like first class, you can't be an economy seat person anymore. And the oh. credit card, you know, that was going to get you in the door here. Well, now you got to spend 75,000 a year in order to be, you know, anyway, there's a whole bunch of lounge. They, they should have something Ooh. called like lounge gate. Lounge gate. Ooh, yeah. Lounge gate. Let's do lounge that. Because oh, that guy I'm kind of dating, he's like, I travels all over the place and he's like losing his mind about the airports and all the flying. Wait, and- is this the gentleman that we discussed? Yeah. Oh, we are going to talk it's more only about a, that. It's only there. a week. We're only a week into it. So we don't want to talk about it yet. How we're talking about this off air. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Great. So now let, let, everybody. Okay. Okay. We, we are the guys and gals. We're definitely going to come back and do a whole thing on points because I got a billion questions, but yeah. we have got to get get through this because Alyssa's yes. got other shit to do. <laughs> yeah. I got to get my girl today for the dentist. Okay. So moving right along. Here's another, the next part that's really fascinating. So we get into the eighties, uh, out, out of the eighties. And at the end of the eighties, FICO this company FICO comes along and they create a credit score. They use this mathematical model and they go to Experian and TransUnion and Equifax and say, we have this scoring uh, mathematical, you know, analytical model that we can apply to the data you have in these credit reports to give them a predictive risk factor, a score that then if we can get the, the banks to use this as part of their process, you know, we're gold. Like we are gold, right? We're going to be, nobody else is doing this, right? And so they go out and sell this score. Well, 1995, the year of the Lord, just kidding, the year of my graduation, 1995, mortgage companies, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Fannie Mae, FHA, oh, they, not FHA, actually, FHA at the end of uh, 99, 95, they start using, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac start using credit scores in mortgages. So only 95, that's not even that long ago. That was the, I can remember my mom in high school because my mom's been a loan officer since I was like six. And I can remember her in high school being like um, reading these things called TRW reports. And they were just reports. There was no scores involved. She, you know, she would have to package this FHA deal that was almost like her. She was like an attorney practically because they were these huge files where you were really you were going into the underwriter doing your dissertation on why these people deserved a house. And at some point, a lot of people just start saying, how about a hundred bucks? How about a hundred dollars? And the underwriter would say, thank you very much. And so much discrimination going on that when credit scores came along, they were like, boom, no discrimination, just scores you based on your behavior. And we're call it a day. So scores, Hmm. 1995, we start using scores 1999 FHA starts using scores and using like automated underwriting to get stuff through faster. Nothing else is, nothing's manual anymore. Start mortgages start happening, you know, the quick turnaround, right? Mm -hmm. It wasn't until, and this will, this will blow your mind two years after September 11th. Okay. Think about that. September 11th just happened two years after was the first time in history that we could see our credit reports for the first time. What? 2003 was the first year they made an amendment to the Fair Credit Reporting Act and said people will now have access to see these reports and scores. Not technically the scores we're using for a mortgage, but that's coming. That'll more to come on that. But yes, you can see the data, the actual accounts and what they're reporting on you. 2003. And 2003, we we had a pulse, we got a house. It was like credit was crazy. It was like nobody needed credit. Nobody cared about credit. We were like, you know what they did? They hired Susie Orman to be the FICO, my FICO kit. Remember that? The my FICO kit. I remember that. And it was funny because Chad and I last night, I'm talking and I said, yeah, but didn't Susie Orman, um, wasn't she the spokesperson for my FICO? Didn't she come out with a kit? And and, uh, because at first he said Susie Orman had nothing to do 
with the 2003, you know, the FICO um, change and stuff. And so I said that to him and he came back and said, I'm sorry, I stand corrected. You are right. I'm like, thank you, Chad. Anyway, but he said, Susie Orman, I will send you it for proof. He said, Susie Orman was part of all that. Susie Orman also like, you know, a few years later, 2012, came out with this um, credit card that was called the approved card. And she promoted it everywhere. And she said, this is going to change your life. And this is going to actually report uh, to the credit bureaus. And it's a prepaid card. Well, I remember that. Cards don't apply. Prepaid cards don't report to your credit. You load them, right? You load them. In order to use them, you load them. It's a prepaid card. It's like a gift card almost, right? It's not a credit card, but it looked like a credit card. Well, we said some whatever. I, I remember that being sold, like you said. I remember that being sold as something that parents would give to their kids. Yes. Build their credit. It's pre-approved. It's card. safe because they can't go on a spending spree at Tiffany's, right? Yeah. It's and like, the okay, truth this. was, it was never going to report to the credit bureaus, but she had some sort of inclination from TransUnion that they were like, well, you know, if you get enough people, we might consider. That's, a, that's bullshit. It never happened. Yeah. So she doesn't, nobody remembers mm -hmm. that about her because I still see her quoted all the time and stuff. And I'm like, you guys, you know, but here's the thing. Susie was all about at that time. Let's teach the world about, um, FICO scores. And she didn't really know that after the one that she was talking about, uh, the classic FICO we use right now, that in FICO 08 would come out, FICO 9, FICO 10, FICO 10T, all these other versions. That now we have 50 different versions out there. So, and it's a very different recipe. So what she was teaching back then was good. It's just then she got carried away with the approved card. And then around that same time, we have Ramsey who steps up and says, you don't need them. You don't need yeah. the credit score. You don't need the credit cards, which was great timing because we couldn't get a card. It was really easy to go. I, if you notice after the crash and everything, it was it was um, a lot of big players and Ramsey, too, that I remember that were like and Grant Cardone, you know, a little bit. We're like, um, you know, we, we don't we pay cash for everything. And I, I have to say it was probably likely because. They couldn't, they didn't know how to start again. They didn't know how to, we weren't taught that. Ramsey wasn't even, Ramsey at that point probably didn't need anything, but he doesn't know how to live in a world without a credit score and not be rich. He doesn't understand that it's a stepping stone, you know? That's, so, that's interesting. Uh, the reason I say it's interesting is that I actually had a, a chance to have a private lunch with Dave Ramsey uh, yeah. a number of years ago. And one of the nicest freaking dudes you'll ever meet, mm -hmm. honestly. Mm -hmm. Like this is a little short dude. I walk in. Yeah. He's like, hi, my name's Dave. And I'm like, hi, Dave. Who the fuck are you? And they're like, that's Dave Ramsey, that's the guy, that's the speaker. I'm like, oh, I've heard of him. I don't ever heard, have I heard of him. <laughs> but the point is, is that he he's a very good listener, but he's also very from my one interaction with a gentleman, he's very no bullshit. This is the path. I'm I'm this is my ride or die path. My way or the, yeah, my way or the highway. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, so I, 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 yeah there, he was very. Yeah, very, this is like color my lines or get the fuck out of the way. Yeah. And you're like, okay, so it might work. So is that, so with that being said, so, cause a lot of people like him, a lot of people don't like right. him. A lot of people we agree, a lot of people don't agree, but. And he got a lot of people to a place of, of even thinking of changing their beliefs in their head of thinking they could even live a debt-free life. And that is the probably the most important part of his message. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that you really talk about a lot is you just like, look, I'm going to tell you what's up. I'm going to give you the right tools. Oh, by the way, I have a lead for you to tell you. Um, you're not going to like it, though. Oh, but <laughs> but uh, you said Perfect. bring you the dirty and the ugly. I'll bring you the dirty and the ugly. Uh, but, you know, it, it's it's the educating the oh, general yeah. public so they can make a decision and they can go Google. They can go to chat GPT and at, get questions or at least get a framework or a basis of the what they should know, what they should be starting to do. Go to a professional like yourself, get the real insight and then the actionable steps. But we're just never taught that stuff. And it just right. It's dumbing down America even more, mm -hmm. especially in the finances, because, you know, the government, if. We all learn how we don't have to pay so many taxes by loopholes that are legal. They're going to lose a lot of their funding and they don't want right. to lose their funding. They like to spend our money. They yeah, really they like to spend our money. Like they love to spend our money. It's just uh, the gap is so huge right now. Yeah. So when, oh, yeah. okay. So to, just to kind of carry through, sure. we've got like, you know, fed going up and down. We've got the fed. Uh, we've got the housing boom 
which you and I were both here oh, yeah. uh, going through. Um, the Bankruptcy Act is kind of interesting because that was enacted in, in 2006. Now, that really changed a lot of the laws. I'm sorry. I try not to touch my hair, people at home. I'm sorry. I have a nervous tick. I won't do it. Yeah, but none um, of us care because it's just you. My mom, my mom cares. My mom called and said, you got to quit. She said, hold on to something. And I was like, what am I going to be like this? You know. <laughs> Bankruptcy <right>. Act. Okay. <laughs> Change the rules. And it made it where, you know, it wasn't that easy. It was, it didn't, let me just put it this way. The PR message that went out with that was, it's going to be really hard for you to file bankruptcy. And guess what? We're getting ready to hit the shit and you're going to think mm -hmm. about it. And we changed the rules. So good luck. You know, so I know a lot of people like heard a bit of that. And then they walked around going, well, can't file bankruptcy now. You know how you kind of just kick yourself out yep. because you think you don't qualify, but not really. I mean, even to this day, if anybody's out there and they do come across this time where they kind of look into options, reach out because I have a great um, lady who's got a great website with bankruptcy calculators that are accurate that like, you know, without having to talk to anybody, you can put your own numbers in, kind of play mm. with stuff and see whether it makes sense or what your, what your options would be. It's much better to be able to explore it yourself, though, um, before you sit down with somebody, you know. Yeah, bankruptcy is also a very scary thing. Um, I, after 2008, I went through bankruptcy and foreclosure. I lost uh, two mm -hmm. houses, two cars, and a very unpleasant girlfriend. Um, <laughs> because I didn't make enough money for her. And of course, quote. of and, course, you're um, gonna see a lot of that coming. <laughs> oh my god, yes. And it's yeah. not the, and the fault of anybody who's not making the income they used to, it's because the market has shifted. I mean, it is. with AI, there's gonna be tens of thousands if not, if not millions i think more millions of jobs will be shifted to ai yeah um i mean there's a report in san francisco uh then we'll get back on track there's a report of a guy and i saw the video myself uh, they have they've been testing this forever but they have these cars driving around all over san francisco with all these cameras and sensors on them basically mm -hmm. learning really learning the mapping out the environment right testing mm -hmm. how to drive and they have people behind the wheel but the car is actually doing the driving well for whatever reason, this guy really didn't like the AI. So he went around that car with a hammer and beat the shit out of every camera and every sensor. And then he started smashing the windows. The guy really hated the AI. Yeah. So I don't know how that's going to affect us. But I mean, it sounds like most of the culture is going to go down that AI way instead of, uh, you know, doing it the human way and being right. taught and being able to you know, move forward. So anyways, back to your list. You know what though? It's still going to be somebody like we were, we've been talking about the operating of everything is still has to be done by humans. Like, you know, me attacking Chad and my, my mom attacking this attacking is probably not a good word, but me, you know, me talking to Chad and my mom talking to Chad is not the same conversation. You know what I mean? It, it all, uh, it all is about what you feed into it. Uh, the prompts you give it. But mm -hmm. those are even getting easier. Um, I found, uh, yeah, I won't talk about it right now, but I found another chat GBT I really like it, um, that I'll tell you more about later. But it's a, um, but one of the things in there is it says, um, talk to, um, talk to chat um, uh, in a sarcastic, witty way. And you can have a conversation that's more where he'll be more sarcastic and witty with you. I'm like, going, dude, this is amazing. So I can make him any personality I want. <laughs> I can make his, him tell good jokes. I'm like, ah! <laughs> it's like crazy. And then, I mean, it's even one that says like, talk to Chad, like he's your therapist. And you can talk to Chad and go, Chad, mm. I've been feeling, you know, tired, heavy. You know, are you facing depression? Did you, well, let's talk about what how what was your mom like between the ages of five and eight? Oh, oh you know. my god, that is great. He loves hearing <laughs> all about me and my I'm just kidding. <laughs> guys everywhere are like, what? Um, okay, so the bubble burst. Let's get into the 2000s. <laughs> That's a good way to lead in, lead in all it. So it's all 06, too many hmm. houses. People are just like. What's the consequences if I walk away from my property? Nothing. Okay, I'm Nothing. gone. Oh, my whole, all my whole neighborhood did too. Uh, okay, and I'll never. I'm gonna be upside down. I'm gonna have to pay this house payment that um, is a debt that I'm upside down on. Even though we've done that for years with cars, we were like, no, not gonna do it. Not gonna do it with a house, right? 
So we walked and a lot of people, if you hung on to your property all the way through that, you know, it did go like this and Hockey then stick. crash. And then, and, and then it came back up by about 2018. It was exceeding what the values we saw on houses back in the Oh five, the height of it. Oh six, you know? Yeah. But that's a hell of a long time that's to long pay time. into a hole and yeah. just praying with crossing your fingers going, please baby Jesus, make the values come back up long time. When, like you said, I, I watched neighborhoods. It was like a spark in a tinder box. As soon as that one neighbor said fuck it i'm not paying these big banks back mm -hmm. the other neighbors they're having conversations in bed going well honey what are, what are we gonna keep paying them what, yeah what about the kids in the school what about food what about this what about that so it's like you know what hands in the air we're out of here yeah especially because that before credit card active 09 came along uh that that changed all of this back then uh it, there was a thing called universal default. Okay. It still happens today, but what would happen back then is if you went 30 days late on a mortgage, it alerted every other piece of credit you had and that credit closed on you. Like I had a couple that were a realtor um, and they were like, you know what, we're going to short sell this one rental property, but we're not, you know, everything else is going to be paid on time. Uh, our house is going to stay the same car, everything, you know, we're just going to have the one debt that's going to become a short sale and first 30 day late all of her credit cards closed they closed they weren't allowed to be reopened they were just like hey we know what you're doing we see the track we see what's going on and that's what happened everybody started kind of now they can still do that to the sense of like if you go late or if you start carrying higher and higher balances on your credit cards they could get nervous and shut you down like at any time they have no rules. Credit cards can take their, your, your, you know, take that away from you at any moment, anytime. No, they don't even have to have any reason for it. They could just be like, you know what? We're a little nervous right now because of the world. Boom. Closed. And you're like, what did I do? Big deal. Right? So like, um, that was happening. So once people were like, well, I'm just going to throw in the towel on this. And then their cards all started closing. You know what they did next? Fuck it. Like I'm not paying it now. Okay, the highest charge off rate. In other words, charge offs happen when a payment hasn't been reached for six months on a credit card or four months on an installment loan. Mm -hmm. uh, that's when the account charges off. The charge off rate was at the highest, was about the second quarter of 2010. Wow. Okay, that's when it was it. Well, I, at that time, I was like, okay, so seven years is the shelf life for how long bad debt can stay on your credit. So let me think about this. So 2010 plus seven years. So in 2017, um, everyone's going to have a clean slate. Um, they're not going to know how to rebuild because we weren't really taught that Gen X wasn't. We were taught how to build credit, like get a card that was handed to us on our um, at ASU and, you know, didn't have to do anything for that. In fact, I think I, you know, I got I got a lot for it. I got shirts. I got, you know, swimsuits, um, all kinds of weird stuff from it. but little bit of a different world in 2017, where not only have after the housing crash and all the Dodd Frank came in, the CFPB, the ability to repay, all of the rules came in to where you couldn't just go off the honor system and apply for something and say, yeah, I make enough. No, they were like, we want documents. We want to prove you have the ability to repay this debt. And that put us in a lot better position than where, where we were going into the crash where everybody, you know, you know how it goes. Strippers were had five houses. You know what I mean? It was they just like whatever. Did. Yeah. And it was the truth. But it, it's not that way now. You know, now people that own their homes, most of us have like a lot of equity in our home. We're sitting on a lot of equity at a very low interest rate for the people that own homes right now. So mm -hmm. we're not walking away from that. I mean, we might sell, but where are we going? So we're holding out. You know what I mean? Unless and there's a, a large want or need or a desire um, I, I talk, I do thousands of phone calls. I, I did almost 1100 calls yesterday. I'm going to probably do 2000, 3000 calls today. Crazy. And I talk to folks that are sitting in their homes that are a little bit older and that exact conversation happens. Well, Greg, I got a 2.75% interest rate. Why in the hell would I sell? And my right. response back is you don't, I know. you stay there until the last breath leaves your body because you know You'll, what? Yeah. Your, your, your payments elsewhere will quadruple. Mm -hmm. for a less of a home. So yeah, 
why move? Why right. why take that credit? Why take that that tax hit on your on your equity? Unless you can write everything off or ten thirty one or whatever. But why pay the commissions? Why do that? I mean, unless you have a want, need, or a desire, right. stay. And they right. are astonished. I actually recommend that. They're like, why would you tell me that? I'm like, because. Yeah. <laughs> I would you even I mean there is vehicles obviously people there's reverse mortgages you know where yeah. instead of forward but here's the thing if you refinance out of your two or three percent now you're gonna get a reverse you're not gonna have a ha principal and interest payment you're not gonna have a house payment every month but there is a payment it's just coming out of your equity and now yep. it's based on seven and a half percent or wherever the rates are now so that's a very hard thing to I it's more everything right now is like a prep a prep conversation. It should be something you should be looking into a strategy for the future, especially if you have parents that are getting older, if you have kids that are getting ready to go to college, like look at student housing and then look at what's the possibility of actually getting my kid, a, you know, starting them on the right track to get their scores up when they're 18 and getting them to be a non you know, to be a co-signer, like on an FHA loan at the college, you know, take part in the investment of the property, all of that. But we, we just, that's kind of where I was going with the 2017 is like we, a, a new world, we kind of came out into this new world. Um, and, and, and it was so like, I remember the, my book came out in 2016 and I remember thinking people aren't even aware how much their credit score is impacting how much they pay for a house. Truly, like I'm talking $400 difference in the monthly payment for a $400,000 loan um, for somebody who had a 679 versus a 701. What? 400. Then you go to the car loan. Then you'd go to car insurance and home insurance and stuff. And they were like, people with low, low credit scores are paying three times the amount of somebody who just got a DUI. I'm like, what? what? So when I started like coming on the budget going, they have the same life. It just costs more. They have the same house, the same car, the same policies, but it costs more for you to not be on top of your credit score game. That and is terrifyingly, it's, it's, yeah. it's accurate, but it's, it's almost criminal to not, to build a system, ha expect everybody to play by the same rules but then not give them the rule book no and say, rules out there. Go. No, no, no. And it's like the blind man. It's like a blind man bumping around a dark room. I mean, yeah. eventually he might find his way out, but it's a pretty crummy situation to be in. And that's what every single college kid, whatever majority of adults are. And I mean, if you look around at, maybe they just don't even trust the average American or average, average human on the, on the planet because the, the education has let them down. So when they do like the man on the street interviews, like, Hey, tell me the vice president's name. He tell me the speaker of the house's name. He tell me how he got credit, you know, anything like that. They don't know anything, but you ask them about the kid Kardashians and what right. their latest episode was or what this other pop star is doing. They know everything about them. Every, right. They know their fucking pets names, but they don't know how to get themselves in a better situation financially. That, that literally, in my opinion, is criminal. It is. And that's, and that's, that's the and thing predatory. in my head a lot. When I, when I come across people my age or older or whatever the case, anybody who's got any kind of attitude about TikTok, Okay. And I'm talking, believe me, there's a visceral response I get from people that know that I'm on there, but here's the thing. My, my dream was to somehow take color, my credit, bring it into the senior year of high school, second half of senior year before they go out into the world, learn about color, my budget, my credit, my taxes, insurance, home, retirement, legacy, all of it. Right. But, uh, what happened in the pandemic was everybody went home, not to school and they turned on their phone and they turned on TikTok. Yeah. And for me, I thought with my girls being 14 and 16 and me desperately trying to stay in front of them and be mm -hmm. relevant and be interesting and be like, you know, without being, of course, I'm a little bit over the top, but I'm not one of those moms. that's like, cool, gone, you know, no, like I wanted to stay in front of them. And I thought, God, this information is boring as hell. I know that's in here that my ex-husband hates and everybody else hates, but this stuff is so like foundational that mm -hmm. if they don't know this stuff, it's like the make or break of them being broke their whole life. Like I can't, 
I've got to make it blingy. I've got to, if I got to curse a little, if I got to be like, try to act like I'm Jay-Z or whatever, whatever I got to do to try to make this information interesting and not seem overwhelming or to, to people uh, and not feel like people want to just clock out because it's over their head. I want them to be like entertained. And then, like I say, then they leave and they're like, am I educated? Oh my gosh. You know, like I want them to be shocked that they, they actually learned something from that. You know, well, it's like when you trick a kid into eating a vegetable by, yeah, t by saying totally. it was something else or blending I'm it into flower. something. <laughs> yeah. I, I personally, I love veggies. So I, I mean, I was the kid always eating all the vegetables, Yeah, but a lot of people don't want to get the knowledge. Yeah. You got to fill them in and it has to, and like for most folks, that's kind of like eating your vegetables is learning about boring and a shit but you do it in a very entertaining, easily digestible platform and uh, personality wise. So if you're a little quirky, I can be a little quirky. If mm -hmm. you're doing this, I can do that. Yeah. You're giving people permission to be themselves and mm -hmm. learn in a fun way where it's not like there's going to be a graded exam at the end of this course. Right. If you get over, if you get less than 92%, you fail. It's like, yeah. what? no. Like okay, the nuts. gym is doing a great job. The gym has done the best marketing. Look, is it, let me ask you, is it really, honestly, is it really that fun to work out? Okay. Yes. Let's just be honest. Okay. Yes. I'm just saying sometimes it is. And sometimes it really isn't, but somehow <laughs> gyms across this, the country, uh, have made it fun interesting it's good you know it's more than just you know it's all these things that make you overcome anything you know most of the time that make you not want to go i don't know i'm just thinking yeah. we just need gyms for credit and then we're we're good you know that's really it really pretty much is it, it is that's what you kind of built i mean a fun gym like i used to go to these boxing classes and kickboxing classes and all kinds of other stuff now did i feel like a like like not so manly going in there and playing kickboxer yeah i felt did not feel so manly i'll put it that way but i went because my instructor was this little five foot something gal yeah, talk about a ball of energy she made it fun yeah and, and made it so it wasn't like he feel like he should put on a tutu and go you know go go into the class with all the girls right no no you go in there you get your weight you get your shit and, you, and she treats you like uh, like a normal human yeah not like you're not a normal human if you go to the gym but i mean for a guy's mindset it was like why am i gonna go to a girl's workout class There's well they sold me on it and i kept mm -hmm. going back for years because i had a blast doing it so i mean I anything think we, you can do to tie them in you know because i anything. think that it's just so it just doesn't we just have so many beliefs um that we live our life in you know um I, I, I was listening to something earlier this morning just about, you know, really, what is that belief in your head? Um, you know, like, let's say that somebody called me up and said, uh, we want you to do, uh, uh, we want you to speak for our next event. Okay. Naturally, women, we tend to go like, oh, cool. Do you want me to bring anything? You know what I mean? Like, it's not about how much do you want to pay me to speak? It's mm -hmm. I'm, oh, sure. I'm here to help, you know, whatever the case, right? And there was a, a YouTube thing I was listening to that was like, no, next time you walk in, you say it's 20,000. You don't, and you don't stutter. It's 20,000 a talk. And it's like, it's about God. And I think about how many times in my life I've had to forced to uh, step up for myself and demand what I'm worth. Yep. That's and a big one. When you can get to the point where you're fine with saying no, when you mm -hmm. realize what you have in your head, they need. Then you put the price, and it, you might not get it the first time, but you're going to get it eventually, or yeah. they don't or get you. Or and, don't do and, it. And so you keep bringing the value, and you keep bringing it and bringing it, and maybe nobody will ever see it. But maybe Ronald McDonald comes along and says, you know, you never know. But I'm saying you have to demand it. And women, we just don't demand it. We will demand only to where we, we're pretty sure that we wouldn't, we won't come off like a bitch. We won't come off like, you know, you know difficult because we don't want to be looking at that way but really? you have to especially in banking of all things you have to go in and be like yep but it's all it starts with the belief in your head because you think i'm really going to say 20 i want twenty thousand to speak for 20 minutes you think that if i didn't believe that you know and it's not going to work you know it starts with the beliefs it so, does it does and that's where you need to believe in education at some level right mm -hmm. so guys 
go out and start educating yourself. Alyssa has you know, th literally thousands of videos on TikTok. If you want to get a subject covered, I bet you anything that it's there. And if it's not, she'll make a video about it. That's not, that's not yeah. the hard part. But take this information, go share it, go learn it. Mm -hmm. You don't have to tell anybody that you don't know it, but get educated. Watch a video a day. You know, yeah. Tackle one subject a day. That's 200. If you did that during the work hours and work days, that's 280 new things you learn a year. When's yeah. the last time we learned 280 new things in one subject matter in one year? Uh, they call it the asphalt uh, university. And mm -hmm. the, the the average commute from a place of work to home is about 30 minutes with traffic. Mm -hmm. And when I heard that, I was like, holy shit, my drive from Walnut Creek to Danville is 30 minutes. That is freaking nuts. Yeah. So they said, if you listen to a book on tape, book on tape, mm -hmm. there's a, there's aging me, an audio book, um, a podcast, a YouTube channel, not like the pop stars are us kind of bullshit, but like yeah. something educational that actually can be foundational in your life. Yep. You do that for one year. Yeah. You will have the equivalent of a master's degree in that subject matter. No and question. it's time that you're already spending doing something else. Mm -hmm. Why not get every book, every podcast, every, everything about any subject, but then it's not just one year. Then it, yeah. Another subject next year, yeah. third year, another subject, fourth year. It keeps going. Five years, guys, you have five master's degrees in five different subjects. How badass is that if you're already using the time and you can start today with your credit at Color My Credit? Yes. I call them financial squats, you know? <laughs> if you're going to go to the gym every day, if you're going to commit, like I, I'm going to every single day, I'm going to pray for 10 minutes. I'm going to, for 20 minutes, I'm going to exercise, get my heart rate up. I'm going to um, write my gratitude list, you know, mm -hmm. just put in there that for 30 minutes, I'm going to do financial squats. Okay. I am literally going to do things, exercises that make me better today than yesterday about the subject of money. Even if it is just evaluating my own personal dashboard of what credit cards, what kind of pockets I have for saving, what kind of what are my credit cards offering me as far as little benefits and all the bonuses and stuff? But it's just stay, uh, it's, it's be making it a priority. Like if you just 20 minutes a day, you make money a priority in your life. How can I make more? How can I save more? How can I grow more? How can I give more? If you just focus 20 minutes on that every day, then like it's, there's going to be a benefit after a year, you know? Dude, uh, I know we got to run, but uh, my when I was younger, I I grew up with ADHD and dyslexia. They didn't really yeah. know what I had. They actually thought I had a brain tumor. So they oh put me through gosh. so many tests. I was like a human, you know, pin cushion with all the needles. Um, they might figure it out that I just had dyslexia. <laughs> but um, the uh, the learning curve on that was really kind of shitty because I had to go to a, a school where I had to learn how to read. Like it was a special school for dyslexics, had to teach us how to actually survive in public eye. Mm. Well, I didn't go to normal classes, so I wasn't always in school like other kids. So my mom, since it was purely teaching me how to read, she, since she's a teacher, she took up and she made me do like spelling and grammar. Um, and she would teach me every single, every single week, like every single, uh, dig readers digest, they had a, um, vocabulary section in there. So mm -hmm. I had to write out the words, understand the words. the words, so on and so forth. I hated doing that, mm -hmm. but I'm very thankful for that because now I put it into a day-to-day -day activity. Imagine if you start with your kids coloring their financial credit mentally so they understand the differences. Grant Cardone, he was given one of his speeches and he called up his daughter and he read out a scenario on a commercial property and he said, okay, calculate how I get to a six cap. They took the check like, you need to purchase, purchase it for this amount, put this down, this terms. And he goes, if I can teach my daughter how to do cap rates, why can't you do them? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, your Gotta attention goes it, where, you, where you focus. Yeah. So That's start crazy. learning. Start understanding. Your kids might hate you or hate the concept. It's like eating uh, Brussels sprouts, which I like again. But you know what? They're going to be so financially full at the end of their, but they need to get it, get out of high school. They're going to be fucking ripping smart, probably hopefully buying their own first apartments or properties when they're in college as assets to live in, you know, rent to their friends and make money off these idiots. Right. I mean, showing just, them that it, it doesn't have to be uh, a burden. 
Okay. There's ways to make it, you know, make it work for you. Look, it's something that's not going away. You're going to need it in your life. You might as well find a way to make it interesting. I'm a big believer in like, uh, helping kids though, find, find their way. It, 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 you know, we all learn differently. Um, some people are like, I'll, I'll give you a perfect example as I'm stuttering around here. Uh, my ex-husband, when he was growing up, he got a job. First job was at Jack in the Box. And mm -hmm. he had to stay in that job. He wasn't allowed to quit the job at all. His, it was just constantly told to him, if you want a car and you want insurance, then you're not going to quit. And there was no alternative. There wasn't like, hey, if you find something else, we can look at it, but you're not going to quit the other job first. You're going to make, give them a two week. You're going to do it the right way. It was right. just you work. And so he hated work hated it, despised it. When, when, you know, he would tell me all this stuff on Friday night, all of his friends would be coming through the drive-thru and he's working the drive-thru. I mean, that sucks, you know? That sucks. So all of this resentment that kind of builds up about work. My mom at 14, you know, started me off, her being a single mom, you know, looking at me going, where would you want to work? If you could work anywhere, where would you want to work? Because what you're going to have to do is work on a lot of places to figure out what it is you don't want to do. And yeah. you won't find that until you go do it. And I think I had 17 jobs between high school and college. Like I, I wanted to try everything and make it very, very clear that whatever profession I got into, it was, I, I chose it. I chose right. it. It didn't choose me. Right. And it was just this, my mom used to say like, I know that there's people you see out in the world and you cannot believe that that's what they do for a living. Someone pays them to do that job every day. I want you to focus on those. I want you to find those things that you can't believe people get paid to focus on that. If you do that, you won't ever really feel like you're working. Nah. It'll always just feel like an extension of who you are and what you are. And that was the best thing she ever told me. So we had two different sides. My ex-husband was, um, is a, is a hard worker, but, um, he didn't get this intrinsic motivation from a young age of work ethic of what it made you feel like and, and some autonomy, like some ability for him to choose like what he wanted to do. I was like, mom, I want to work at wet seal. That was my first job, 16 years old on my birthday. First job. I was like, I work at wet seal, you know, and I wanted, I worked at the improv and I moved to Hollywood when I graduated college and worked for Bill Maher and HBO. I would have never went for it if I didn't have that mindset in me of, of my mom saying, Go see what you can do, you know? Hmm. What really is Wet Seal? Wet Seal is a clothing store. It was very similar to like um, Charlotte Roos, if you know what that is. Or Okay, well, it's like a girly. You had to have layers on. Like, yeah, you had to do a lot of folding. But it was mainly like a lot of <laughs> poppy music. And, you know, I always, I, you spend your whole paycheck on clothing there. That's, that's oh how it works. Oh, my God. That sounds horrible. It but was awesome. You know what? Taught me how to, like, you know, style. <laughs> That is too damn funny. All right. We got to get you, your daughter to the dentist, like yes. ASAP, like literally ASAP. I know. Um, where can people get a hold of you? If they live under a rock, where can they get a hold of you? Um, go to colormycredit.com or glutzgroup.com. You'll find me both uh, there. You'll find my phone numbers, address, all that. That's my direct cell phone. Any phone number you see out, out there, even if it's on your bathroom wall, that's my, <laughs> my real number. People are like, or you give me a real credit. number? I'm like, that's me. Text me as me. Yep. You got to put your number out there. Otherwise, yeah. what are you going to get? It's like, come on, guys. <laughs> um, okay, guys, stay put tuned. I think next week we're going to be coming back on our normal day, which is going to be Thursdays. Uh, I think, I hope. But we shall see. We, we, we will be back next week, no matter what, with some more credit updates, credit shows. Stay tuned for uh, Wednesday, guys, our normal show, Real Estate Uncensored. We got another amazing guest coming up tomorrow. So, you guys, thank you so much. Truly appreciate you. Hope you guys have a blessed day. Hope you're going to take something from this show and put it into your life and share it with your clients. All right, guys. Until next time, peace out, ninjas. We're gone.